All right, guys. Ooh, out of the projector. Here we go. It's good to see everybody. What a nice small room. There is no competition. I mean, there's no competition, only collaboration, right? But there is no competition in this city. So this is a good sign. So you guys, uh, I'm really excited and honored to be here. It's uh, my privilege. I don't do a lot of speeches or talks. Uh, Andrew and Michelle were rhinos. They came in, they crushed it, they asked me to come. So I just did it as a favor to them. But uh, I'm happy to be here with you guys. And this night is for you guys. So pick my brain. I'm gonna, there's, after you leave this room, there's no reason why every single person in this room cannot do a $10,000, $20,000 deal like within the next 10, 20, 30 days. Wholesaling is easy. Wholesalers are complicated. So I'm a really simple guy. I got a 990 on my SAT. That's my total score. So, um, so uh, this is really simple stuff. If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not easy because most people don't want to sell their home and the people who do don't want to pay your low price. So it's a numbers game and it's difficult for that reason, but there are so many deals. I had a chance to meet with a few people today. People are crushing it, making tons and tons and tons of money. Uh, some of them not even, not even living here. So uh, they do it virtually in this market. That's how good the market is. And when Andrew shows you a slide like he showed you before, uh, it just tells you that there are gonna be more cash buyers fighting over your deals. And the guys and girls who have the most cash buyers, they make the most revenue. So, we're going to we're going to dive right in. I'm going to tell you everything that works about wholesaling, exactly what it is and exactly how to do it. And uh, let's get started. So if you have any questions, I'm here for you guys. So there's nothing for sale. This is not a sales pitch at all. So there's nothing to buy. If you have a question, stop me. If you're confused, stop me and we'll go over it. Uh, I'm here as long as you need me. So uh, let's, let's first of all talk about what are we actually talking about because there's so much confusion about what wholesaling actually is, right? So some people will say, well, it's having to do with assigning a contract. It doesn't. Wholesaling is very simply the art of consistently finding discounted properties. That's it. That is where the definition ends. If you can get really good at finding a discounted property in your neighborhood, you can become a very, very, very wealthy person in a very, very short amount of time. That is absolutely true. And everything I'm gonna tell you tonight is absolutely true. And if it's not, I'll tell you, hey, take this one with a grain of salt, but everything I'm gonna tell you is coming from, from doing it or from teaching it. So it's, it's uh, that's a fact. If you can get good at finding deals, you will become very wealthy. Um, every single good deal, whether you are Donald Trump or Robert Kiyosaki or any other real estate investor, every good deal starts with a discounted property. That's it. So what is a good deal? Whether you're a rehabber or a landlord or a flipper or a buy and hold or buy and put on MLS or buy and assign the contract, it doesn't matter. All of the margin is made when you buy, a, when you find a good deal. Make sense? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All right. So wholesaling has nothing to do with your exit strategy. Wholesaling is very simply an exchange. It's like a pawn shop. What it is, is you are giving the seller speed and convenience in exchange for a low price. That's it. It has nothing to do with real estate. It's all situational. If you can really in your belly understand what I'm saying about that point, this business will be so easy because it is easy. It's literally, it's brain dead easy. People make it about the real estate and they complicate it. It's not about the real estate. It's about an exchange of speed and convenience for a low price. Cool? Easy. Okay. So uh, the other thing too is a lot of people focus on like sales strategy or negotiation strategy and there's all these books and there are a few good books, right? I, I really like Oren Clef has one uh, called Flip the Script. Uh, he talks about ABL, which is always be leaving. And there's a really, there's a, there's a few cool strategies out there, but here's what I will tell you. If you are a deal finder, you don't have to be good at sales and you don't have to be good at negotiating. That is absolutely true. So if you're worried like, oh, I'm a timid person, I don't like to talk to people, you're finding deals, you're not creating them. Again, most people don't wanna sell, and when they do, they don't wanna sell at a low price. So you, all you have to do is, you have to, you have to just say, great, I, this is not a deal, I'm gonna go find one. And you'll know when you find one, because they're very obvious. You, you, it's after a while, after two or three of them, you'll be able to find them very quickly. You'll know in 30 seconds. 
Uh, and again, of course, no competition, only collaboration. This especially is true uh, in, this, in this city. This is a B market, which is uh, a way that we define markets, and it is a smoking hot city. There are, is, there's not nearly enough wholesalers to cover the amount of properties uh, that, that you could come in here and uh, make a fortune in a very short amount of time. Um, so before we deep dive wholesaling, I'm just going to tell you when I started, uh, I was very successful at wholesaling very, very early on. Um, I will tell, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share with you exactly why I feel like I was successful because I did a few things differently than other people did. Uh, first of all, I'm a Christian and I tithe. I will tell you tithing is in the Old Testament and then some Christians are like, well, it's not in the New Testament. No, it is in the New Testament. It's in Matthew 23, 23. So it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So uh, in Malachi, it says if you don't tithe, you're stealing from God. And if you do tithe, you're it's going to run overflow. So I'm just going to put this out there that uh, when I got started, uh, I went to a Sean Terry, I went to a Sean Terry uh, event in Atlanta. This is when I was 33 years old. I'm 40 years old now. And um, Sean was talking about the book, The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity. I then, within a two-day period, I had three people tell me about tithing. Uh, one of them was Louise, uh, and then there were two other people. And um, I started doing it. it, it, it automatically, it's uh, God's Word's real. That's all I'm going to say about that. It's not a religious event. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Also, Jim Rohn talks about you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. This is absolutely 100% true. If you find a person who's like poor or they're always like they have a victim mentality or they're always, they always have like a latest emergency every time you talk to them, look at who they're spending time with. All of those people have the same exact problems that are going on. Trying to spend time with a person and not be influenced by that person is like if I told you to go for a swim and try to not get wet. It's impossible. So when you listen to Jim Rohn's advice, you have to pick the five people you're gonna spend the most time with, but more importantly, you have to really start to cut out some people. So one of those people was a family member for me that I was very close with, and I had to stop spending so much time with him, um, and he went down a totally dark road that was not good, and I'm glad that I did. I, you know, I, I, wish well for him, but I don't want to be a part of that. So uh, it's not just about who you spend time with, it's about cutting out who you're spending time with is even, I would say, even slightly more important than who you spend time with. Um, Progress, not perfection, massive and perfect action. We're gonna talk about more of this on another slide, but education is preparation. I'm gonna give you some stuff that you can go out there and make a lot of mistakes. Adopt this attitude early. When I was getting started, I was getting instruction. I was making a ton of progress. I, if you talk to anybody in here who's done deals, who's already done deals? Who's already done, okay, awesome, a ton of the room, okay. so. Was your, was your first deal full, full of mistakes? You had the wrong contract, wrong person, wrong title company. You didn't say something, you write. So everybody who is get started in real estate, whether you have five years of training and a license and experience or you just start tonight, it's all about progress, not perfection, uh, and massive and perfect action. So just go out there, and if you don't know what you're doing, just make a lot of mistakes. The guys and girls in this room who get the most results, who make the most results, uh, make, make, make the most mistakes and get the most results, those are the ones who are going to make the most money every single time. Anybody in our training program, when they're on the phone and they're like, oh, I got this property under contract, but I'm only on the first module. I don't know what to do. Always the guys and girls who are going to, they're like, oh, I made 500 this year. I made a million this year. Always the same people every single time, every single time, without exception. So massive and perfect action, progress, not perfection. Perfection will kill this business. So just go out there and make mistakes and look like an idiot and then go right back out and look like an idiot again. All wealthy people, right? They, do they care what you think about them, right? Is this like a common thread with wealthy people? They don't care what you think, right? They're willing to have awkward conversations. Have you noticed that wealthy people are really good at awkward conversations? It's because they don't care what you think, right? <laughs> That's the key, so really easy. Um, the other thing is that since I've been standing up here and since you guys have been sitting in the audience is that the same amount of time has passed for us. So throw time management out the window. There's no such thing as time management. There's only priority management. So if you say you want it, you want it, I really want it, I really want it, all I have to do if I want to know what's important to you is I just have to look back at what you did in the last six months. That's all I have to do. You don't have to say a word to me. I all I have to do is look at your time and I say, okay, well, you spent this much time at this thing and you spent this much time with your spouse and this much time with your children. I know exactly what's important to you. So if you want to really dominate time management, just make stuff a priority. And there's ways to do that, uh, which we'll get into in a minute. 
One other thing that I did is up until the time I was 33, I really wasn't a reader. Every, I, I noticed that the only commonality with all wealthy people is that they all read. They're all different ages and fitness levels and races and nationalities and uh, different educational backgrounds or some have no college and some do. However, the one thing that they all have in common is every single person is a reader who's wealthy. Every single person who you're like, this is where I want to be, I guarantee you they have a library. You ever notice like every house that's over a million dollars always has a library? Mm -hmm. There's a reason. They all read. So commit to eight pages a day, even if you're a slow reader, even if your guidance counselor told you that you're an audio learner or visual learner. If you can read street signs, pick up a book, read eight pages a day, just do it. It's your muscles of brain. It'll, it'll change your whole life. Um, journaling is really key because your brain will play tricks on you, so don't make a big deal. You don't need like a fancy diary with flowers on it. I don't have anything like that. It's, um, you just get a journal, write one sentence a day. What did you do? Hey, I, you know, I, I took Lacey to ballerina school today. She had a great time. You know, I, I, I spent, you know, so it doesn't have to be about business, but just start getting in the habit of writing down every day one sentence a day of what you're going on, going on in your business or your life, and you're going to be amazed when you go back what you wrote down and what you thought happened and what actually happened and how your belief system starts to play tricks on you. So it's, it's a really good practice. Other reason that I was successful was because of my mentor. This one is key for me because my mentor was my older brother. So that was, I was very fortunate because I knew a few things about my bigger brother. Uh, number one, I knew he was very wealthy. I knew he was rich. So I, I didn't have a question of like, you know, when somebody's trying to like sell you something, you're kind of like, well, does this person really know what they're doing or are they just trying to sell me something? So I didn't have that problem because he was my brother. Uh, the other thing that I had is I knew he had my best interests at heart. So that was really, really important for me because the top reasons that new wholesalers fail is they either lose faith in the mentor they lose faith in the program or they lose faith in themselves. It's always one of those three reasons. The only other thing that could come up is a distraction because they see something that's shinier. They're like, oh, seller financing. And they're like, oh, rent to own. And like, I'm gonna do this. And then they, that, that could also happen. But it's usually they lose faith in their mentor, they lose faith in the program, or they lose faith in themselves, which is actually the most common. Like, oh, this guy can do it, but you know, Tom got a 990 so he can do it, but I can't do it. So that's uh, hopefully not gonna happen to you guys. So if, if you are struggling, if you have a mentor, just ask yourself like, hey, where is my belief system on this? Do I really believe my mentor is doing this or can, has the ability to teach me? You know, can I, do I really believe that I can do it or do I really like have a fear of money and success and things like that? So let's jump into uh, a little more specific information here. So uh, no, number one reason most wholesalers fail is education. Education is a showstopper. It's a deal killer. Uh, education is absolutely the number one reason new wholesalers fail. Um, the way I want you to think about education from this point forward is if you can do this, uh, this is going to last a lifetime for you. Not if you're a doctor, but if you're a wholesaler, this is the best, uh, which is instruction. You get clear instruction. You guys have Andrew and Michelle right here. Total, total rock stars, rock stars, right? Like $3 million portfolio, all these doors, like amazing. Um, get clear instruction. Don't question it. Don't, when, so, when somebody who is richer than you and more successful tells you what to do, don't put it through the filter of your, like your, the, your own brain and be like, well, what do I think about this? No. You either are going to submit to a mentor or you're not going to submit. But don't play games with them and yourself. It's wasting everybody's time. If you just want to be successful, emulate. That's what successful people do. They find somebody who's successful and they just do everything. I used to tell this, I would, I would, Todd would tell me what to do and I'd be like, I don't want to do this because you're my older brother and you're better looking than me. And when we were in high school, girls used to come over to my house to hang out with me but then really want to hang out with you. And so I'm not going to listen to you. And then you'd be like, no, you do it right now. <laughs> so I'd be like, fine. And I would do it and that was a game changer for me. And when I would ask him a question, he would hang up the phone. That's what he would do. And he would say, don't ask me questions because if you're going to ask me questions, I'm not going to coach you. And that's how, and because I had that strict training from my older brother, it was like a Mr. Uh, Miyagi uh, Danielson type of relationship. Um, I was super uber duper successful right out of the gate. Um, so here's the key. Get clear instruction from wherever you trust. Take massive and perfect action on that instruction. Know you're going to fail and don't care what other people think of you. You're going to get a result and that's going to be your education. That's the whole secret to this whole business. It's so simple. Wholesaling is simple. Wholesalers are complicated. This is the answer right here. 
That you, this is an I cannot fail solution right here. Because if somebody who went before you is doing it, they're going to tell you exactly what to do. Just follow it. Don't put it through the filter of your own opinion. Legal, legal, let's talk about legal. So every single state is different when it comes to real estate investing. I'm just gonna say this. I have a lot of friends who are very, 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 very wealthy. You never hear my wealthy friends sit around and make fun of attorneys. You know who makes fun of attorneys? Poor people. You ever hear like poor people get there, they're like, oh, attorneys like bottom of the ocean jokes, right? All this stuff. You know who doesn't do that? When you're sitting with people who are like, this guy's 600 million, this guy's worth 500 million, this guy's worth a billion, and this guy's worth 20 million. You, don't, you know what they say about attorneys? Oh, do you have a good attorney? I need a good attorney on my team. I need a good attorney for acquisition. I'm going through a merger. Who's the best attorney to cover me here? Who's, so make an attorney part of your team. They're local, they're here. Treat an attorney with respect. Listen to whatever the regulators tell you to do or not do. Every state is different, but no more making fun of attorneys because only poor people do that. You guys are wealthy, so we're not going to do that anymore. Um, okay, let's get into, we're, as we go on each slide now, we're going to start to get into more specific detail on how to wholesale a house here. Um, number one secret, all of the men and women who came before us have all taught us these lessons. All of the great men and women that we hear about, right? Like all of these great guys and girls, they've left us books that tell us all the answers. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything has been done before. There's no new original thoughts. Everything is done before. And one of the, thing that they, one of the things that they've taught us from Rhinoceros success with Scott Alexander of charging at one thing at a time or Gary Keller with the one thing, one thing. This is so important to your success. People will be like, what about Richard Branson? He has so many businesses. You know what his one thing is? He opens up businesses. That's what his one thing is, right? He's not working in the airline, right? You don't see him on the flight. So the, the one thing is so key. So what I would focus on is whatever you're going to do, find one way to find homes, one way to buy homes, one way to exit. That is it. This will be the difference between somebody who builds a business and somebody who builds a job. Because you can, you can start to say like, oh well, sometimes I come across an account where the seller has a lot of motivation but they have no equity. So here's what a job person does. I'm going to learn how to do subject to deals. No good. right? Here's what a wealthy business owner does. I'm going to totally ignore that opportunity and focus on the, only the people who have equity and motivation or I'm only going to focus on the people who have motivation and no equity and just learn subject to deals or whatever, rent to own, it doesn't matter, rehabbing, landlording, whatever, but stick to one thing. Don't try to, to build a case by case basis, right? You see, you see these people like I want to learn how to do invest in notes and I want to learn how to invest in this and I want to, the reason they want to do that is because in their job mentality, so in a job mentality, every opportunity is an opportunity. So they're working hard and they'll get to 60 or 70 and they'll keep working and they'll be chasing cash. Not the key. You want financial freedom? Chase the business. One thing, do it really well. It's super easy. This will serve you for a lifetime. Okay, where do you find deals? So this uh, slide is super uber important, so let's spend a little bit of time on this slide because now we're going to get into like the nitty gritty of wholesaling so that you guys can leave right now and do a deal. That's the key. Um, okay, first of all, these are lists. So lists are just groups of people who may be more motivated than other groups of people to sell their home at a massive, massive discount. And remember, we want to be deal finders, not deal creators, right? So we're looking for deals. We're not trying to create them. This isn't about how good you are at sales or negotiating. So the majority of those sellers are going to live on these lists. Um, these lists are smoking hot, by the way. So this is like not common knowledge lists. So Andrew, Michelle will tell you like some of these lists aren't even out to at all the rhinos yet. So this is just stuff that I'm just doing for you guys. So number one, unknown equity, unknown sale date. This is a list that you can get from list source. All that means is that these people, for some reason, there's a classification problem in the county, city, township, or municipality, and they don't know what the equity is. Why is that a hotter list than most lists? Because they've never been mailed before. And just that in itself of people who are unknown and haven't been mailed before because we're in a numbers game, just that in itself makes it a hot list. Absolutely, go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. So there's a guy. His name is Peter. He works at Caldwell Banker, uh, at Caldwell, sorry, List. And you can call Peter. 
and um, just tell him that you're a friend of the rhinos and that he'll and he'll hook you up. Uh, Peter and Caldwell is the name, and the other uh, the other list company that will work here is going to be PropStream, and you can um, and PropStream would work for you as well. Yeah, South Carolina is a non-disclosure state, right? Um, okay. Other one is 24-hour arrest record list. Use your brain on that. You know, if you're having a, if a, fi a, vi a violent felon, anything like that, obviously, I need it. Where's my attorney? I need it. <laughs> so um, obviously, do not go to a, uh, somebody who's just been arrested uh, recently um, for a violent crime by yourself. Um, but 24-hour arrest record, what you're going to find is very often those are tenants and the landlords are super frustrated or it's an owner and they need to do something with the house right away. So people who have been arrested. Now, I'm going to tell you some of these lists are difficult to get even in regular disclosure states. However, if these lists are hard to get, they're smoking hot. So I just want you to know, if you go to the county and Sally and and whoever at the county is like, well, we don't have that list. There's no such thing. Like nobody gets arrested in this county. Just keep bringing donuts and coffee and find, you know, after you speak to Sally, speak to Gertrude. And after you speak to Gertrude, speak to Michelle and then uh, whoever it is. And then just keep finding and just have stick to itiveness because if that list isn't available to get like right out of the gate, it is worth potentially four, five, six hundred thousand dollars. And that is not an exaggerated number. It's literally sitting there waiting for you to be picked to be picked up. Does that make sense? So hard to get list, you shouldn't be like, oh, this list is hard to get. I'm not like I'm just gonna call, I'm not even gonna visit. You have a list that's hard to get, your brain should be like, oh my goodness, I just found a list that's hard to get. Like I don't I will be there at four o'clock in the morning until five o'clock at night trying to get that list. Crystal clear, right? Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Okay. So that list includes 24-hour arrest, arrest record. Tax delinquent is two or more years behind at least. Code violations, code violations for anything, it doesn't matter. Don't try to be partition the list out to like this code violation or that. Uh, probate and pre-probate, which I get that list from Tangi Cousins at Foreclosures Daily if it's not, a, if you guys, but if you can get it direct, every list is always better directly from the county or the city opposed to a list company. Uh, inheritance I get from US lead list, that's Lance and Terry. Um, but again, if you can get local attorneys to give you that list locally, phenomenal. Uh, the water turnoff list, super hard to get, super smoking white hot list. People who have their water turned off, they're literally like, please come and help me sell this property immediately. So smoking hot list. Um, eviction, so any landlords who've recently evicted a, uh, a tenant is phenomenal. And bankruptcy, anyone who's claimed bankruptcy should be getting mail from you and anybody who has a lien on their property. There again, you can get both of those last two lists from PropStream. Um, and if you say that you went to Wholesaling Inc., they'll give you like, I think there's like a bonus or a discount or something. But um, those, are t those are great lists. So any questions about the lists that we went over? Go, yes, sorry. Uh, probate and pre-probate, I, I buy it personally from Tangi Cousins at Foreclosures Daily. Yeah, and a lot of people will say like, what's pre-probate? And I will tell you the greatest thing about this business, I have no idea. I have no idea what pre-probate means. So it's phenomenal because like, I don't know or care. All I know is every time I mail it, I make money. And that should be your attitude, right? Don't overcomplicate. Like if, if you're like, what does pre-probate mean? It's just like, it doesn't matter. Whatever, right? I mean, who cares? It doesn't matter. Just stay focused on, you know, next deal, next deal, revenue, first position, revenue, first position, you know, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. That's it. Um, any other questions about these lists? No? Yes? No? Okay, good. Easy. This is simple stuff, guys. Okay. When you send out your marketing, whatever your marketing is, or what, um, there's only, what happens is your marketing goes out, whatever it is, cold calling, uh, direct mail, bandit signs, postcards, uh, radio ads, it doesn't matter. Um, whatever it is, there are only five ways that your phone calls should end. Now here's the reason. If you guys right now are owner operators in your business, I'm going to tell you the people who follow you, who come in like your acquisition managers and your disposition managers or whoever you're working with, they are not going to do what you say. They are going to do what you do. So that's why it is so important that you have a system in place and not you in place. 
So you have to follow a system so that the people who come in to replace you so that you can have a business instead of a job will do what you do. So here's what we're looking for. Number one, they're either hot, like they're ready to sell right now, or they're warm. If they're hot, drive to their house immediately, get the house under contract. And don't do, and we're gonna talk about how to get the house under contract, but this isn't like, oh, I'm gonna do some research and get back to, no, 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 no. We're gonna get the house under contract. So if they're hot, you drop what you're doing and you go and get the house under contract. If they don't live there, you do not mail the contract, you do not email the contract, you send a mobile notary to their home. It call, it's like mobile notary, one, two, three, mobile notary. You send one, it's like a hundred bucks and you get the house under contract. You don't mail them the contract or email it to them because if you do that, the brother-in-law is gonna be like, oh, Sally, he only wants to pay 125, I'll pay you 150 for that house. I wanted to buy it for your nephew, which he never will, but it's gonna delay the contract. You control your destiny, not the seller. You control your financial uh, future, not, not the sellers or anybody else. So you have a hot deal, get it under contract. If it's warm, like they're kind of interested, massive follow-up. People will always say like, what's the follow-up sequence secret? There is no secret. Everybody in your database needs to get out of your database. So be bold on the phone. Do you want to sell your home? Why don't you want to list with an agent? Why don't you want to just be a renter? Why don't you want to rent it out and be a landlord? Constant follow-up. I'm not supposed, I don't have any calls today. I'm not supposed to call this one for three weeks. No, no, no. You call them right now. Call them right now. Offend people in an aggressive way, in a good way, right? Because you're calling them too much because this is how you're gonna get your deal. Because I guarantee you somebody else will be. So if they're cold, right? They have no interest. Oh, I'll sell my house for $800,000, whatever, right? If they're cold, send them a written offer. Now, let me just say this. If you guys were my acquisition managers, right? There's, this is not a discussion. This is an absolute commandment in this office, right? This is, our, this is our real estate investing office, and you guys are my acquisition managers. If I'm your acquisition manager, here's the, here's the rule. Every single person who's like dead gets an offer. Why? Because a lot of people who are not hot on the phone, they're actually just like, oh, I'm really in a bad problem, but I don't want to talk about it. That's actually what's happening. So every single cold lead gets an offer, no exceptions. Here's the other reason. If you are kind of deciding, well, you know, Johnny sounded hot and you know, Mike sounded cold, so I'm gonna send a written offer to Johnny but not to Sally or whatever or Mike, the problem is your acquisition manager is gonna do the same thing. And do you think they're gonna send out a ton of written offers or they're gonna just do it like on a case by case? and it's gonna be a case by case, and they're gonna miss uh, an extra three or four or $500,000 for you that, that year. So um, anyone who's cold gets a written offer, no exceptions. Written offer, with the offer, you can t train your VA or you can do it in your system automatically to just say, hey, 60% of Zillow or whatever. It doesn't, whatever you wanna come up with, we'll talk about pricing in a minute, but they must get an offer. And I will tell you, when this first was told to me by my older brother, I was like, you're crazy, I don't have a lot of money. I was totally, totally broke at the time. And I said, I don't have the cash to do that. You know, everyone is like, it costs like a dollar to send it out. And the first, and he's like, no, you're an idiot, do it. And I did it. And the first guy who called me back was this guy, Paul, who wanted, he was on Salaz in Port St. Lucie Street, and he wanted $85,000 for his house. At that time, that was ridiculous, because Port St. Lucie was totally in the dumper, and this house was in a bad area and I sent him an offer for 24,000, and he called me back like a month later, because they expire, seven days, they expire, right? So the offer expires, so it's like an actual, even though it's a marketing piece, it's like a real contract. So he called me back and he said, can you still do 24,000? Because things have changed, I got your paper, but it expired, I said, well, I don't think so, but let me come over, and I got the deal for, I think, 16,000. It was one of my first ones, so yeah. So I will tell you absolutely, like if you realize like, what's the secret to making a lot of money in wholesale? Like that, right, it's the secret. Like that is so no brainer, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, it's just send an offer. It's not even, you know, like, it's so simple. Um, if you get a voicemail, leave a message, text, and keep calling and keep following up. I know this is ridiculous, but the whole thing is, it has to be a written system. Oh, did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so, so you have to think of the offer more of like it's going to spur a reaction out of the person, right? You're trying to like create an event where they're like, you know, hey, 
I'm trying to buy your house. You know, like there's a new voicemail that we leave now. Um, I'm going to answer your question, but there's a new uh, voicemail we leave now. We used to say, you know, hey, this is Dan with uh, PSL Homebuyers, and, you know, we, we talked about buying your house. Because one thing that we do, this is like a little trick, is that every four months we voice blast the entire database. It's a game changer, right? So every four months, voice blast the entire database. And we used to say, oh, like, uh, um, hey, Barnes family, how's it going, guys? Good to see you. Um, so every four months, we, we uh, uh, blast them and we would say, oh, you know, this is Dan. We spoke about me potentially buying your home if you still want to. What we found was much better. I think that I have to give credit to Claude Diamond here is uh, we'll send out a voice blast that says, hey, uh, I've got the contract here for your house. Um, I'm just, I, I have a question about the, uh, I think you guys use parcel ID maybe. So we have a question about the parcel ID number and like your phone will literally just melt. So it's psychologically, it's not that you're trying to find the right offer number, it's that you're trying to like create an, like a, a wake up call, that this is a real event. Um, as far as actually coming up with the number, um, we've done so many deals now that we know exactly what to put in reference to, for us, and this is in my county, um, we know what percentage to buy off of the tax value. But what you'll do is the more deals that you do, you'll start to find a sequence that's happening, like, like all of a sudden you'll start to realize, like after you've done a dozen deals, you're like, oh, Every single deal we do is always like, we're always paying like 7% below the Zillow price. Or we're always paying like 18% above the tax value or, you know, and that's usually, so uh, the reason I say that is because you don't want to have the VA for this reason using like a complicated comping system. It should be like a really quick, like just general, you know, and Andrew can help you locally to just say, hey, in general, you want to pay about, you know, they've done enough deals that they can tell you kind of the differential between a fixed number you know, the appraised value, the tax value, the Zillow number, there's usually something that you can go off of for that. But yeah, just remember it's about creating a marketing event. That's the key. So you don't sign the contract, but you do make it time sensitive. It should expire like seven to 10 days. So awesome. Um, it's a cash buyer. So sometimes when you're in this business and you're doing your marketing, you're going to actually get calls from cash buyers. Uh, they will call you agents, brokers, whoever. Um, just add them to your cash buyer list. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Or if they're rude, stop contacting them. So a lot of people, especially new wholesalers, because they're aggravated because they're going through the trenches and they're like, oh, you know, and then somebody's rude and they try to like mess with them back. I would suggest not doing that. So just, <laughs> just leave it alone. There's no reason to just, you know, waste your time. Um, so every cold lead gets an offer, no exceptions. Crystal clear, easy peasy, lemon squeezy? Bam, all right, I love it, good. All right, how do you come up with the price? Uh, here is the secret to coming up with the price. It is so simple, it's branded. Like it should take you 30 seconds to come up with a price for a house. So anybody, if I catch any wholesale in this room, Going into a house who's never done a deal, pretending they're going to rehab the house and talking about the price of granite to a homeowner, I'm telling you, I'm just going to appear out of nowhere and be like, stop doing that right now. <laughs> so we're not going to, we want to be truth tellers and truth seekers, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So here's the deal. Number one, don't tell me you don't know how much a house costs. That is the most ridiculous, my, I have an 11 year old daughter, Lacey. She could tell me the price of a house because it takes 30 seconds to go to realtor.com or zillow.com or anywhere.com and just say, what's the price of a house? So there's square foot price. Pricing. Agents can tell you square foot pricing. It, you can find out the price of a house in 30 seconds. So there's no excuses. So number one, it starts in your belly of what you think a good deal is. That's really the most honest answer I can give you. Um, it starts in your belly. The other thing that I always want you to consider when you're like doing research instead of having an awkward conversation with a seller, which is so important, is I really want you to understand what are the consequences if you are wrong about the price. If you're wrong, you cancel the contract. You have a 10, 15 day inspection window, cancel the contract. You have good intention. It's not like, I would never say to go and trick a seller and offer them more and then wait 30 days and then cut the price. You never would do that, right? But if you intentionally, if you really believe, like I think that $98,000 is a really good deal, then that's what you do. Does that make sense? So, so I just want you to understand that there's nothing that can go wrong if you're wrong. You just cancel the contract. No, um, Another key point here is if I were to ask in this room, right, if I, we went, all of us went to like 123 Main Street and I said, what's the value of this home? What's the price of this home? Right now, just the current market value or the ARV value, whatever value you want to use. If I asked five agents, five appraisers, five landlords and five rehabbers, I would literally have 20 different prices that would range like within $100,000. Literally, I am telling you. You know the people who are like, I know, I know, I've been in this business. They don't know. 
Like it's crazy. It's just because real estate's so emotional. So, um, and ARV. There is no using ARV. Uh, there, I will know because there's enough rhinos in this room. What, 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 some rhino, tell me, what does ARV stand for? Bam! Assumptions reduce victories. That's exactly what it stands for. So if you're a new wholesaler and you're trying to come up with ARV, which is so beyond ridiculous, right? I mean, not to like, but it's just, just think about it, right? To know ARV, you have to know how long is the house going to sit on the market. No way a new wholesaler knows that. Number two is you need to know how much it's going to cost to rehab the house and you have to know to what point and then what it's going to sell for. It's literally an impossible number. A professional rehabber doesn't know what ARV is, so there's no way a new wholesaler is. But here's the bigger problem. If you start doing ARV and looking at this and looking at that and pretending like you're a rehabber, you're actually going to do less deals because you're going to be, uh, you're a race car driver and I'm telling you not to look at the wall and you're looking right at the wall and you're going to drive right into it. That's exactly what's going to happen because the problem is as wholesalers, we don't win on price. So when you're talking in ARV language, you're making it about the price. Do we win on price? No. Are we ever going to be the highest offer? No. Who are we looking for? Motivated sellers, right? So you guys, it is so important to not make this rookie mistake about making it about the house or pretending to act. That the worst advice ever given in human history is act as if. Do not act as if. People will not root for you if you pretend to be something you're not. Just be who you are and people will root for you. They'll be like, oh, you know, you have a really good heart and you're the underdog. I'm rooting for you. I want you to make money on this. You go in there with like, you know, slick back hair and you're like, well, you know, bull nose granite, half inch, it's so expensive these days and you've never rehabbed a kitchen, it's ridiculous. I mean, the whole thing just goes sideways. So that's the majority of how to evaluate a house is all in that top part. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's talk about how to do it in 30 seconds or three minutes. We'll give you three minutes if you're new, right? Here's what we got. Very simple. Take 80% of the three lowest comps in the past six months. Use common sense. So if you take a 3-2, similar square footage in the similar neighborhood, um, you take the three lowest comps. If there's one that was like a fired, burned out property and they're all like 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 and there's one that sold for like 25,000, just eliminate it. Just use common sense, right? Take that number, get the average of those three and minus 20%, take 80% of that number. So if it's 90, 100, and 110, the average is 100, you're gonna offer 80. The only caveat is before you make your offer, just check against what's currently for sale, that's it. So look your house, you say, okay, I'm gonna offer $80,000 for 123 Main Street, then look at what's for sale that's also similar, right? Similar criteria, similar square footage, similar neighborhood. If you see like there's three other properties and they're all for sale and one's like 79 and one's 83 and one's 89, you're way too high. If you look in every other property for sale that's currently for sale, right? So this is for sale and this is sold, right? So if you're looking here and you see every other property is like over 200,000, you're way too low. Use common sense. The, the magic of wholesaling doesn't start until you start to have conversation with real estate investors who have cash. That's after this, not before it. Does that make sense? Any questions on valuations? Yes? What do you do about repairs? Nothing. Because usually, and the reason that I don't consider repairs is because when you look at the three lowest comps, they're usually houses that are pre-rehabbed houses. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you're looking at like, you pull up comps, right? And you go six months, everything that's sold in this area. And you say, okay, well, all the three twos that have sold, there's, um, you know, there's 23 of them. Well, the three that are the lowest are usually gonna be significantly lower because they were damaged, they were, you know. So they're all, you're usually getting that um, range. But the, the thing that will protect you is this second step that's specifically in there for that reason. So just in case nothing, everything was pristine, you'll know when you go to check it against what's currently for sale. Would you frequently reduce the price if after the inspection you discovered that there were repairs? Yes, so, so um, there's a few caveats there. So when it comes to, like some people, wholesalers will call this giving it a deal a haircut. Um, let me just say this is the bottom line, right? N just as a general rule, never, ever, ever, ever reduce 
uh, a contract if you're already making money to make more money, right? So the only time that we, we reduce is only if we're not gonna make money. And, and I'll give you a trick on how to do this. This is so simple, it's gonna change your whole investing career. It's the best thing you've ever heard. So when you wanna get a lower price, never, ever, ever, ever negotiate. This is how you get a lower price. Hi, Mr. Seller, how's it going? Good, good, good. Uh, I know we're supposed to close, um, but I, re looked, I looked at the numbers and I have to cancel the contract and cancel it. And they're gonna say, uh, what do you mean? I thought we were gonna close like in three weeks. No, I took it and then cancel it again. No, I took a second look at the numbers, I can't do it. And then just ask this question, say, where should I send the cancellation agreement? To the property address or to the mailing address? And what will immediately happen is the seller will go, oh, I was really counting on you, buy it. Well, what can you do it for? And now they're negotiating. If you negotiate because you're afraid that you're gonna lose the deal, if you're like, well, I know, you know, but I mean, I'm not sure if I can do it. As soon as you do that, this is what happens. Seller puts on a negotiating hat and deal's dead. You just lost it. As soon as you cancel it and they know you're not joking around, the deal opens up and you negotiate to whatever price. This works like 99.5% of the time. It's amazing. The first time I use it, my brother was like, "This is." I'm like, "This is never going to work," because I was, at that time, I was, I, it was a, not a good deal. And he's like, "I'm telling you, it'll work." And I did it. And the guy hung up on me. And I called my brother. I was like, "You blank, blank." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Yeah." I was so upset. But then he called me back the next day, and he was up in New York. And he called me back, and he's like, "I just, just tell me what you could do." And I'm like, well, I'm not even really sure I want to buy it. So then I went right back into the script. So I'm constantly always pulling away, pulling, right? Because what a rookie does or what a new wholesaler does is they're, they're like, the, as soon as the, the, the seller starts to pull, they're chasing and they're leaning in more and more and it gets like super uncomfortable. But when, when they know that you're serious and you're real and you're canceling and you're not negotiating, all of a sudden, like all of a sudden, deal just went to like 20,000. So, and to, when do you do that? As fast as possible. You have a deal under contract, you're on day three, you know it's not gonna be able to be closed for whatever reason, cancel it immediately. The worst thing you could do is drag a seller out to like day 29 or the end of the inspection, because every day that goes by, it, it's, it, you're changing the dynamic of the relationship with the seller. So uh, cancel it immediately. So you know on day three you're not gonna be able to do it, just boom, hey, I gotta cancel the contract. Then they're gonna say something, whatever they say, no, I gotta cancel the contract, and then say, where should I send the purchase, the cancellation notice? To the property address and to the mailing address. And then as soon as you say that, shh, don't say a word. Next person who speaks loses. So it, it's gonna be awkward silence for like 30 seconds. I'm telling you, you're gonna be like sweating. Just mute the phone and be like, ah. <laughs> But it really, really, truly works. It will, this, I promise you that this will blow your mind. You're, you're gonna be like, I cannot believe that this is the crazy, but that's just like a little trick that'll help you on that. All right, any questions about valuations or evaluating a property or coming up with an offer price or anything like that? Bam. Okay, how do you, now you have a property, you go and meet with a seller. How do you get the property under contract? Again, you guys, this is so easy. Don't overthink this simple, simple, simple stuff. Okay, so be the sea dragon. Who knows the mating habits of a sea dragon? Anybody? Nobody. All right, I'll educate you about it. There we go. All right, bam, I love it. All right, so here's, here are the mating habits of a sea dragon. Um, and it's really simple. It's called mirroring. This is actually something, again, that I learned from Sean Terry seven years ago when I went to his uh, event. He calls it mirroring. Uh, sea dragons do too. So what happens is the, the, um, the female dragon and the, and the male dragon are looking at each other and everything that one does, the other one does, and they're exactly the same the whole time and they're like dancing, right? That's exactly, like everyone, like all the sales training and all the negotiating, you could just throw it all away and just be a sea dragon, right? So here, somebody get a sea dragon tattoo. That would be awesome. Um, Whatever the seller does or says, that's what you do or say. So you can be really specific and granular about this, like when it comes to physicality, right, or, or the mirroring them physically. If they, if they lean in, you can lean in. If they lean away, right, you lean away. I know this sounds basic, but I am telling you it works 100,000% it works. So whatever they do, you do. If they're really loud and they're from New York and they're like, oh man, I moved to South Carolina, I'm, oh man, it's like it's too muggy down here. Right, just be like, I know, I can't believe it. I wanna go back to Long Island. Like, just raise your voice. But here's where it's more important, right? When they are pulling away, don't chase. This is the most important thing because when you're in scarcity mode and instead of abundance mindset and, you, and they start to pull away and you're like, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose a deal, immediately stop yourself and be like, wait a second, I don't even have a deal. 
So there's no fear here, right? So, so the key is mirror their, their tonality, their volume, their, um, you know, obviously you have to be careful because uh, you don't want to mock them, right, if you're like too obvious about this. Um, but more importantly, interest level, right? So they're pulling away, the, the best, I always say this, it's, and I've been married for 20 years, but uh, it's like dating, right? If you're on a date, it's the same exact thing, right? So just think about like, when you're on a date, right, just do exactly like, if somebody was like, well, you know, you know, and they're like, just be like, well, don't chase that person, right? That'd be weird, right? So if you're not going to do it there, don't do it here. It's, it's awkward and off-putting, and it will actually make them retreat even further away. And you can actually test this. So if, like, you're on a totally cold account, see this, and see, and when they lean away, lean in more, and then when they lean in more, lean in, you're going to be out the door, like, in two seconds. <laughs> so you could, uh, you could try this one. Uh, number two is build rapport with the seller. Here's what all sellers, so if anybody who's new and nine or five deals right since January, so you, you'll know about this, right? right? When you're kind of still getting your feet wet on this, when you first come in, the first thing the seller wants to talk about is what? What's the first thing the seller wants to talk about? I'm asking you. What? Price. That's it? <laughs> exactly right. They're going to talk about one of two things, the price or the house, right? They're going to start showing you the house. Look at this beautiful wall, and I had this installed. And, um, the reason that they do that is because they're super uncomfortable because people don't like to be in this situation, especially our sellers. They don't like it. So the first thing that they're like, oh, okay, come on in, and they start walking around and, sh yeah, and there's a leak here. You have to slow down. Slow them down. That is your number one job. Just keep thinking like slow them down. That's your job. And what you want to start to do is talk about um, their life and what they did and who they were and what they did for work and their children and their grandchildren and what school and do you like this district and or do you not like that district and where are you going? A really great question is where are you going? Why are you selling? Um, Here's a little trick I learned. I was on a phone call conversation with Alex Youngblood from Wholesaling Houses Full Time. And we were just talking back and forth about uh, something. And, and we kind of both said this at the same time. And one thing we both realized that if, if you have a seller who's not telling you why they're selling, which is so important, right? Why is the seller selling? A lot of them, especially the most motivated ones, they won't really tell you the real, real, real why, right? They'll tell you like, well, we're downsizing, but what is that? That means nothing, right? Or they'll like, you know, we're, we're moving to Florida or whatever. Uh, but that's not really a reason. If you're not getting that reason, ask them when they want to sell because the when will very often reveal the why. So if you're just like hitting a brick wall and you can't get anywhere with them, just kind of pivot and say, well, when would you like to sell by? And then they'll usually say something like, oh, well, I have to sell by the end of December because, you know, and then they'll just say the reason, like because the house is in foreclosure or because I haven't paid my tax bill or because I'm going to tax auction or because, you know, my, my, uh, I'm in a domestic uh, violence situation and the, my boyfriend, you know, is, is a truck driver and he's going to be back from California in three weeks. That's an actual story that somebody told me is that they, they, the girl's name was Lisa and she was in a domestic violence situation and um, she had to sell in three weeks because the truck driver boyfriend was on the road and she, she owned the house so she wanted to move and sell and be gone and we did it for her. So if they don't tell you the why, try to figure out what the when is and that will often reveal the why. This is one of the most important things that I've ever learned about wholesaling houses and I cannot overstate the importance of this section right here. Every single question from a seller is an objection. I don't care what the question is. What color car do you drive? What year is your car? How old are you? Where did you go to school? How long have you been doing this? Did your dad teach you this business? I don't care what the question is. Are you going to live in the house? Are you going to rent out the house? Are you going to rehab the house? Every single question, when a seller asks you a question, and their voice goes up at the end of a question, right? So you'll hear it. I just want to train yourself. You automatically should lean back and just be like, wait a second. Because you're there to be the leader and the helper. They're in a boat that's sinking, right? That's who our sellers are. You're there to throw them a life raft, right? So there's, I'm, not, I'm not there to answer questions, right? Because not that I don't answer questions, but I realize that when they're asking me a question, they're actually questioning whether or not I can help them. And I'm here with this big boat and they're drowning and I'm throwing them and I'm like, I don't have time to answer your questions. Are you sure we're a good fit? Are you sure you really want to sell? You know, I drive a red car. Is that going to stop me from buying your house today? But that has to be your mentality. So you should practice this with your spouse or whoever and, and just practice this. When a seller is asking you a question, is it an objection? Not sometimes, 
all the time. Any question, if they're asking you, there's a question behind that question. They're trying to tell you something. I don't like people who drive red cars. I don't think you're old enough. I think you're too old. Do you really have the cash to do this? You know, have you done this before? You know, even if they ask in a nice way, like, oh, this is great. Have you done many of these? Oh, yeah, I mean, but you know, it just, <laughs> like, you just have to, like, stop. You have to just train yourself, like, and just, that, that's the key. Does that make sense? So, so important, guys. I cannot, this is, like, one of the most important things that will really help you get a tremendous amount of deals uh, in a short amount of time. Because you will, if you do this incorrectly, this will be a deal killer. This, if, if you start, if they start asking you questions, and you're like, oh, I drive a red car, and I like red because even though I get more speeding tickets, and I'm going to do blah, 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 blah. No. That's verbal diarrhea. And that shows them that you're scared that you're going to lose a deal. When you start answering questions, you're not able to help them anymore. Just like, you know, uh, just keep this in your brain. This is, this is important. Also, don't bring the contract into the house because you're not sure if you want to buy their house. That seller better get busy convincing me that I should buy their house, uh, that, I, uh, that, that I should give them my money. That seller better get busy convincing me that I should give them their money because there's a lot of houses for sale and there's a lot of sellers and I'm not sure if I want to buy. So you better get busy convincing me. See, it's a whole different mindset, right? I'm not convincing them to buy. You don't hear, or, or you know, now it's Dan, but you don't hear Dan go in there and start to have verbal diarrhea about how great we are and, da -da -da, and how great it's going to be and da -da 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 -da. We don't convince them. We ask questions like, are you sure you want to sell? Why don't you list with a real estate agent? We're not going to be top price. We're probably going to make a quick profit on this and never live in the property. The, the other thing about sellers, are any, if you're with a seller, anything that pops up in your brain that you're afraid to say, say it. I, I cannot stress this enough. Do not try and hide or conceal because the minute you start doing that, your tonality goes down. And you're, you're like, oh, no, yeah, like, no, I'm, I'm probably going to uh, rehab this one and keep it as a rental. And if that's not true, you're going to kill the deal. There's no reason to lie in these deals. Be who you are. Do not act as if it's, it, and don't omit anything. If you're like, oh my goodness, if this seller knew that I was assigning this contract, I'd just be like, I'm assigning the contract. And they'd be like, this guy's weird. <laughs> and they're just gonna be like, well, what does assigning a contract mean? They're like, I don't care, do whatever you want. I don't know the house anymore. I mean, but, but in our brains, we build up this big fear. Like we assume and we, it's all assumption and anticipation of what they're gonna do. It's all not true. Make sense, guys? Yeah, go ahead. Bluntly, okay. very bluntly. So, for well, give me an example. Like, what is the what? Like, what are they asking you that you're not? So how old are you? Yeah. So, so what you can do is you can to be friendly, right? Because you're obviously like a friendly person, right? So, to be <laughs> friendly, what you can do is you can answer the question and you can say, "Is that going to prevent me from buying your house today?" Okay. Or you can also say, "Have you have you bought a house from somebody who was in their 20s before, or whatever?" You know what I'm saying? So, you, you what you want to do is you have to. The, the whole trick is not really reversing it. It's about not trying to convince them. That's the secret. It's, if you're like, well, I'm 25 and that makes me great because I have access to this money and I'm going to, what, what happens is they're automatically retreating. When you're, because people who are confident don't try to convince other people. They just do what they do. So that, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Any other questions on building rapport or, or closing the deal with the seller? Easy. What if yes. They say like I don't like. Well, I don't really have to sell my house. Like especially like if you're already going through like talking with them stuff like that, they'll be like, well, I don't really have to sell it. But if you want to make an offer, you can. Well, this is so this typically would be on the phone before the meeting. Yes. Yeah. So so great. Good. Go because on to the next like, deal. We're already like talking about like you know the house, the history of the house, stuff like that. But they're like usually like when I come in with the offer, they're like oh I don't have to sell. Yeah, it'd just be like well most people I buy houses from want to sell their house. So do you, I mean, just, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so just, yeah, just use common sense on that one. Yeah, but does that make sense? Like, the, you know, the reason that happens maybe is because um, with new wholesalers, what tends to happen is if you look at their call logs, their calls are very, very, very long. If you look at like Daniel, my brother and acquisition manager, his calls are short, 30 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, that's it. Because you, after you do so many deals, you'll just hear it, you'll know, you'll, you'll, it's more about what they're not saying or how they're saying it, um, then you won't get that far down the script. Because you'll know right away. Like, yeah, my house is for sale, 800000 make me an offer, highest and best. Well, I'm not going to be the highest or the best. 
You know, I could buy, you know, are you sure you want to sell? And we're always turning it back. Well, yeah, if you do, why don't you just list with an agent? Are you sure? I wouldn't sell right now. It's a, it's a great market. You could, have you considered renting the house? You know, like I'm constantly like, I'm constantly like jabbing you to convince me to give you my money. I am in no way trying to ever get you, I'm never trying to convince you to sell, okay. ever. Okay. That's as soon as you go down that road, you're losing the war, the battle. You're losing the whole thing. They got to get busy convincing you. Is that, is that, um, did you get like majority of that from flipping the script? Mentioned that earlier. Uh, Flip the Script is by Oren Cleff, and he talks about ABL, which means always be leaving. Uh, there's another book, though. It's by Peter Conti and David Finkel. It's called uh, Buying and Selling Real Estate. Um, Buying and Selling Real Estate by Peter Conti and David Finkel. It actually has a longer title. It's like Buying and Selling Real Estate Without Tenants or Money or something like that. It's a long title, but there's only one book by both of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he talks more about our script that we have that we use in the tribe, but it's, um, that would be the closest. Uh, Oren Clef is more about ABL. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like 90% of it doesn't really apply to wholesaling. But ABL is kind of like you're always, you're never, you always have one foot out the door, right? So think about it exactly like, yeah, it's just, uh, I don't want to go too far down the road, but it's just essentially, just, just think about it. If you find yourself trying to convince somebody to do something, you're, you are in the weakest position and you're losing the deal. Because they, the problem is, is they won't trust you, like you, or have confidence in you. Because they can't, you're there to help them. So you just need to be like there to help them. And if they don't want your help, that's fine. You know, so things, you know, like Judge Judy, right? Like if it doesn't make sense, it must not be true, right? So it's like, just be like Judge Judy, be like, well, wait a second, I thought you just said you want to sell. Are you sure you want to sell? Are you sure you want to sell? You know, most sellers, if they say that, they don't really want to sell. Why would you sell? It's a great neighborhood. You've been here for how long? 25 years? Why don't you stay? You get like a, you know, I mean, you got to really, they've got to really convince you. Because once you cross that threshold that they're convincing you, it's a, it's, that deal is so concrete and ill. It's so easy. It's, there's no way you're not closing. That's a done deal. And speaking about concreting of the deal, if you guys want a really awesome trick, the day you put a property under contract, the very next day have the title company call and ask the seller how they want to receive their funds. Hi, Mr. Seller, we received your paperwork from Tom. Uh, I'm getting everything all wrapped up with the closing. Do you want us to wire your money? If so, I need your wiring information or do you want a check? Do you want to come pick it up or should I mail it to you? Get the seller thinking about the check right away. 24 hours have the title company and we call that concreting in the deal. So it's just a little trick that'll help you make sure that you never lose a deal. You know, you don't want uh, a cash buyer to come in and, and take a deal like from you five days later. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about kind of like a situation. Okay. A seller. Uh, last Friday, I, I spoke with a seller on the phone. Uh, I skipped trace the number, uh, well, the address, and then I finally got over. Okay. And the seller actually picked up and said, hey, I got this is a duplex. It was over here and such and such. <coughs> Right. So uh, he says, well, I'm not interested in selling right now. I want to do some work to it, you know, myself and get them going. But he said, hey, I recognize this number. It's from the low country. I said, yes, I, I'm from the low country. Okay. So on that part right there, he said he doesn't want to sell right now. So he wouldn't be hot as far as the lead wise. So as far as the follow up, would I do it like in a month's time? Would I send him a card? Yeah. So. Uh, he to us that would be he would be considered cold. How how, how many deals have you done though? I've done one with uh, a mentor a while back. Okay, so I would say number one rule for a new wholesaler is every single deal assume motivation no matter what they say. If they call you off of a thirty five cents postcard, they're motivated. Like that's your brain, right? So your brain should always be every single person who calls me is motivated to sell immediately for a low price offer, or until they prove me otherwise. So that's number one. Number two, when you have multiple deals, like two houses or two duplexes, this is a golden rule. 100% of the time, do one deal at a time and totally ignore the other deal. Like as if it doesn't even exist. Just say, oh no, I can only buy one right now. Do that deal and then you'll get the second one. When you try to go for both, you almost always, now there are some exceptions, 
but almost always, especially if you knew, you'll lose both. Um, but the, the thing with them is I would go out and, uh, well, let me just, you want to prematurely come out to every single property when you're first getting started. So if you've done like, you know, less than a dozen deals, pretty much until you get it like a system where you know for sure that you can hear it. Um, because the reason he, like, it, if you think about this, right, again, Judge Judy, right, if it, it doesn't make sense, it must not be true. If you think about it, he's, why would he call you if he's, like, the, that doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm calling you. Oh, you cold called him. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, oh, no, no, with cold calling, do not. So let me take this back. It, do not visit every single property you cold call. <laughs> totally different advice at this point. Okay. Yeah, no, okay. So, but in that case, then I would send him a written offer. Absolutely. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah, everyone gets an offer. He would be one. Yeah, because that guy is pretty, um, yeah, if, if he's saying he wants to sell at some point, you want to like, you want to like get that price out to him as, as soon as possible and then have him call you and be like, I wouldn't sell for that. And be like, well, what would you sell for? And then just go from there. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So just to piggyback off of, off of him, would, is his, would you say or assume that that seller is basically just trying to build it up to get a bigger, you know, for market value? It, it's hard to say. It's hard to say because cold calling is very unique because you're, you're initiating the contact. So I love cold calling. I mean, we sell a product, TTP, by Brent Daniels. It's like, you know, great, right? However, the difference between cold calling and other marketing channels is that if you have 10,000 people to mail or cold call and I have 10,000 people to mail, I may only get like 100 phone calls, right? But you, to get to that, like those two deals out of those or whatever, those three deals out of those 10,000, you've got to make 9,998 phone calls. So the, the problem is it's hard, it's difficult. I love cold calling and I use it, but it's difficult to peg to say like, what is the level of motivation when you're cold calling? It's more of like a continual follow-up system. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when the seller asks you to like, okay, you got, you're about to get a property on the contract, and they ask you to explain the process, what is the best way to go about it? Like, without lying, but without you know, telling them too much information. Well, you know, the, prob the reason you're getting that question is because you're not controlling the conversation. Because that's a question we never, ever, ever get. So you're too much of like a, in a service mentality instead of like, instead of, what I mean service, I mean like customer service mentality um, where you're trying to convince them. So then they're like, well, tell me more about it. And that's not, that's not the way the, the script really works. You're, um, it, 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 we don't really get that. Now we'll get like sometimes like, hey, now that we signed the contract, how long does it take to close? And we could say, oh, well, you know, it probably takes, you know, three weeks. Do you need more time than that or less time? Because sometimes they'll say, well, I want to stay in the house longer. Or there's something called post-occupancy, um, which you can do. But um, you're, that's a question that it's, you're actually causing to have happen. Uh, so what you need to do is your script should be like very formulaic, right? It's like, tell me about the property. It's a nice house. Why would you consider selling it? You know, did I catch you in the middle of something? Or, you know, you, you don't want to... Um, you want to be kind of, your, your script should be formulaic in the sense that it's pulling away every single time. You know, it uh, sounds like you're in the middle of something, um, you know, and then you let them tell you, no, I'm not in the middle of something, we can talk now, right? Uh, it looks like a nice property, why would you consider selling it? So right out of the gate, they're convincing you, right? Well, I'm thinking of selling it because, so the formula that we're using is a little bit, it kind of steers away from that, that mentality a little. Yeah, go ahead. Your bottom line here is that we're either asking questions yeah, well, answering. You, you want to control the conversation. Something I learned from Robert Kiyosaki directly. He said, "Whoever asks the questions controls the conversation." He specifically told me that, and it's very true. It has proven to be very true. So when you're in there asking questions, and when they start asking you questions, the tables are turning. You gotta ask them, answer the question. What's the question? Yeah, but you have to be. Don't be too like that. Could sometimes turn into passive aggressive. So be careful about that. But yeah, essentially, yes. Easy. All right. Cool. Don't be a CBE. What's a CBE? I know we have rhinos here to do that. Cash buyer Bam! Cash buyer employee. Oh, biggest mistake newest wholesalers make. Biggest mistake. This is how you know they, they became a cash buyer employee. You'll say, how many cash buyers do you have? And they'll say, I have a few, but they're really reliable. It's like, that is not a good sign. That means you're leaving a lot of cash on the table. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Cash buyers are a dime a dozen. There are cash buyers in this room that will uh, tell you like, 
I'm telling you, they're everywhere. Especially, did you see that chart that he put up, Andrew? That was uh, that tells you for sure. There's cash buyers are everywhere. Uh, the bottom line is this, without going into too much detail, is if you have a few cash buyers, you're actually, it's because you're in a job mentality, so you're creating a job, so more cash buyers, the better. Build a big list, make it bigger every year, every month, every week, have a, a system in place to build more cash buyers. The more real estate investors you have with cash, the more money you're going to make because you're going to create a feeding frenzy around your deals. Easy. Make sense? The only person in this room who should be upset with that are cash buyers. Anybody else's? Okay, perfect. Okay, um, you stink at marketing and KPI. So everybody in this room, if you're sitting in this room, I just want to tell you this, you are on, if you're like, oh, I'm not sure what, I, you're an entrepreneur. I'm just going to tell you. If you're sitting in one of these chairs or standing up in the back, you are an entrepreneur, you're a visionary. Let me tell you, you are good at a lot of stuff. Here's what you really stink at is, like, I wouldn't hire anybody in this room to be my bookkeeper, my executive assistant, and my marketing manager. And the reason is because you're not detail-oriented. Even though you might think you are, you're not. Just trust me. You're not. No arguments. So, so here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, the most important thing about KPIs is that it's a lifeblood of your business. You must track it. All successful wholesalers have a few things in common. One of them is they have big cash buyers list. The other is that they have somebody tracking their KPIs. KPI just stands for Key Performance Indicator. Um, here are the really simple rules to make this business work for you. You could, you could be up and running with a very, very awesome, super profitable business in 30 days if you follow this one piece of advice. Number one, marketing. Outsource it. You should not be in charge of your own marketing. You absolutely, even if you think you're good at KPIs, you definitely are not good at marketing. And the reason is, especially if you're owner operators, as soon as you get involved with the deal, your marketing falls in the toilet. So you're like, well, how are you doing? And people are like, well, it's a roller coaster. One of the reasons is because of they're not outsourcing their marketing. Here are the rules to marketing. Very simple. Number one, it's got to be big. This is a numbers game. Most people don't want to sell, and when they do, they don't want to sell at your low price. So your marketing has got to be massive. Big, as big as you can go. Whatever your budget will allow, go for it. Don't like drip feed it. Number one rule with marketing, it's got to be big. Number two is it's got to be consistent. This is so important. If you look at new wholesalers, why are they failing? It's 100% of the time, it's because they're, they're, it's not big enough and it's not consistent enough. Number three, is that it's got to have a fast response time. So as soon as somebody calls you, you got to be Johnny on the spot and get back to him right, right away. So immediate. So the third rule with marketing, it's got to be a fast response time. The fourth rule, rule with, with marketing is it's got to be the one thing. If you ask any new wholesaler who's struggling, or any wholesaler who's struggling, and you say, how do you find your deals? This is what they're going to tell you. 100% of the time they're going to tell you this. Well. I cold called some calls numbers on Craigslist, I put out a few bandit signs, I hand wrote a few letters, and I also paid for a billboard and I, I rented some space on a, on a magazine. If you ask a wholesaler who's making $50,000 in net per month or more, every single one of them is going to say this, how do you find your deals? They're going to say, oh, I do this one marketing channel, but I totally dominate in my area. I know exactly how it works. I know when to put them out, what color, what font, who, what list, where to get it, how to source it, when it's best, when it's not good, how it's seasonal. So again, the one thing, marketing has to follow the one thing rule. Dominate one channel at a time and then outsource it. I am telling you, I'm looking at people in this room who I know, who I know their marketing channels and they're very successful and I'm telling you, one channel. So, it's got to be big, it's got to be consistent, it's got to be a fast response time, it's got to be one. And number five, most important also, is it's got to be trackable. So if you're not tracking your ad spend or you're doing something really silly like branding, which is not good, what you want to do instead is you want to have it reversible. So if I spend $5,000 and I make $20,000, all I have to do is say, okay, well this month I want to make $100,000. So I'm just going to spend $20,000 or whatever the math is. Um, you could see I don't do it in the business. See, there you go. So, so um, but if, if you follow those five rules, I'm not going to stand here and say you can't fail, but your likelihood of success, it's going to go through the roof. And every single wholesaler here who's doing well will tell you this, that this is true, that this is Tr honest, wholesome advice that is absolutely true and the inverse is also true. That anybody who here is struggling, I guarantee you, they'll, they may say that they're doing things consistently and big, but as soon as I open up their books and I look and I'm like, well, wait a second, what happened here in three weeks? You didn't do any marketing at all. It's always the case, like 100% of the time. Um, the other thing too is if I bought any of your businesses today and I said, I'm going to own your wholesaling business, you work for me. 
This is what I would hold you accountable. Hey, how's it going? Number one question I wanna know, how much marketing went out last week? How many sellers did you speak with today? How many sellers did you meet with today? If I buy your business, the only way that I'm making my money back, I don't care how, how many podcasts you listen to, I don't care how much branding and you spoke to people and all I wanna know are these three things and I will know exactly how much money I'm gonna make back. I don't need to know the excuse, I just need to know the numbers and I can tell you what's wrong. So if this isn't lining up, um, then I'm not gonna make my money back. The most important KPI to track that's gonna tell me how to reverse engineer your business, so I bought it for 100,000 and now I wanna turn it into a million dollar business, is this. How many calls equal a deal? That's it. Everyone gets so fancy and complicated with KPIs. If you can tell me how many calls equal a deal, I can literally produce a million dollars in your business. Because all I have to do is reverse engineer that number. So if I know if you send out 10,000 pieces of mail, you get a certain number of phone calls, you get a certain number of visits, and you get a certain number of deals, then all I have to do is reverse engineer that number. There is nothing complicated about this business. It's a numbers game. You know, is that 100% accurate all the time? No, but it'll get me close. It'll get me, it'll definitely get me closer than if I don't know the KPI or if I'm all over the place. So how many calls equal a deal? And, and this is so important because it doesn't matter. Some people will say, well, I'm gonna only count leads because only if they're interested. Don't do that. I'm talking about if a unique phone, if you send out a mail piece or a billboard or whatever it is, and you know what the, how many phone calls you got, whether they're rude or they hung up or they didn't leave a voicemail or they did, just look at this number and then just replicate it again and again. That's what a business is. That's why we're all here. It's not for the cash. The cash is meaningless. Money is meaningless. It's simple. It comes and goes. It's like a river, right? But it's the business. That's what provides everything, right? So the business is, the, the business is a, it's a process, a simple process that produces a, a, a consistent result that's delegated to somebody else. That's all a business is. It's just a simple process, it produces a consistent result, and it's delegated to somebody else. So the only way you can you do that is if you know your numbers. You have to live and die by your numbers, and these are the most important numbers, especially after you've done a few deals, knowing how many phone calls, unique phone numbers, equal a deal, because that number is reversible. Does that make sense, guys? Go ahead. So this is only for inbound marketing, like direct mail or a billboard or whatever you do where you do something and then phone calls come in. This wouldn't be applicable to TTP or, or to cold calling or anything like that. Although you could certainly do that as well. The KPIs would be a little bit off though, but you, you just, be, how many cold calls would equal a deal? So, so if you have like five cold callers, like if you know like every 100 calls you get a deal, then just get five cold callers. Don't be afraid to hire somebody because you already know the math. If the, if the math is proven, just keep replicating it. People are like, oh, you're so powerful in your market. Well, it's not that you're so powerful in your market, it's just that you found a broken ATM machine and you're like, well now instead of putting a dollar, I'm gonna put in 20 and I'm gonna get back even more and then I'm gonna put in 100 and I'm gonna put in like 1,000 a day, I don't care. You know, the tipping point is only until the machine starts to heat up and like burn out and that's when you're having so many phone calls that you can't keep up with the, the amount of calls. So you're not gonna reach that tipping point for a long time. Right, so as soon as you find a simple process that's repeatable, just repeat it. it. Don't worry about like the fear, like I don't want to spend money, who cares, spend the money, go broke, and then just redo it again and find another deal. Like, it, you know, you have to think about it in a different light. Make sense, guys? How am I on time, Andrew? Am I good? I don't even know what time it is, is it? Oh, okay, all right, no, so that's fine. You guys just kick me out of here whenever I'm done. Um, so, so that's, um, so it makes sense? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I love it. Okay. Let's talk about how, for this, for this is like, okay, chat, here you go. This is how to, how to create a business. These are people who've already done a lot of deals. Uh, this is a little bit different. This is gonna be, um, what, a lot of people in this business, they, they're like, the first thing is like, is this really real, can I do a deal? As soon as they get over that hump, the very next thing is, um, how do I create a business? because they end up creating a job. This is so common, is that wholesalers are like into the cash grab and they never actually create the, the business, they create the job, and that's because they come from a job mentality. Does that make sense? So number one rule is delegate, don't automate. So this is so important because a lot of, um, like for instance, if you're a wholesaler and you're like, you have an acquisition manager and then you're like, well I'm gonna get Podio, and you start like fooling around with Podio fields and stuff, like this happens all the time. The people you hire 
ha like have at it. If somebody works for me and they're like, I want to use this system instead of that system, um, and use something to automate a process, totally awesome. Like um, one person who works for me, they just wanted to go from schedule once to calendarly. Great. I think that's a great idea. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> awesome. I am not like, I don't want, I'm not interested, right? So the key is number one, find good people and hire them and compensate them well. And you can, if you're starting out, do it with you know, a commission type structure or a percentage structure if you don't have the cash to do it. But get good people and then don't worry about automating the business. The people who work for you will automate. No matter what anybody says to you, never watch your gross number. Right? Agents do this all the time, real estate agents. You'll say, how are you doing? And the real estate agent will say, oh man, great, I did like five million this year. And at first I was like, you did five million? Like I'm in the wrong business. And then I found out that when agents say that, what they actually mean is that the prices of the houses that they sold in total equaled five million dollars. Not that they made five million. So why would you do that? Because when you track gross, you are gross and disgusting. And this is what happens. You will buy like an $8,000 conference table and you'll like rent some office space downtown because in your brain, your brain is like, I did $5 million and I only made 80,000, but your brain can't register that because you're a visionary or an entrepreneur. So think in net, speak in net, don't worry about your net as far as how other people see you. If you think like, oh, I only made 185,000 and that's too low and what will everybody think about me? Wealthy people and happy people don't care what other people think about them anyway. Right, that's like ego is the worst thing in the world. So, so what I would say is the way you can remedy this whole problem is everyone, you, your company, your spouse, everybody, speak in net. Don't worry about gross because if you make two million and you brought home 500,000, that's awesome. But if you make 18 million to bring home 50,000, that stinks. So only think in net and I promise you, if you start operating in net, you won't even get an office and you will never buy an $8,000 conference table. You, you will see who's tracking gross and who's tracking net in the next recession. That's what you're gonna see. You'll be like, oh, that guy was tracking gross. Because all of a sudden it's like they're getting evicted from the office and the car's getting towed. So if you work on net, that will never happen, I promise. Um, get great at delivering one product or service and ignore everything else. You guys, again, the one thing, every great man and woman who's come before us, this is the number one secret they've taught us again and again and again and again. There's nothing new under the sun. So whatever you're going to do, do the one thing. Do it really well. Dominate it and your life will be easy and simple and you won't even be involved. You'll be like in Hawaii or wherever you know, successful people go. They, you know, they walk on the beach. They walk in the woods. They go on their boat. They taste cuisine in foreign countries. They're don't, they don't, not involved in the business. The business is not like, that's not what they do. It's not about it being a cash grab. Make sense? Easy. All right, hire employees, no partners. Number one mistake that new wholesalers make is they get a partner. There's two people here, I won't, I won't point them out, but I, they both know who they are, because one of them I spoke to before, earlier and the other one I've been speaking to for a year. And um, I will tell you this is a huge rookie mistake, um, especially if the partner doesn't bring or add any value to you. It is an, it's, it's, it's a total disaster. It, after coaching literally thousands of people, I can tell you, it almost never works. The only, the only exceptions are sometimes spouses, but here's what's interesting about the spouses, and there's also sometimes siblings who do it together. And it works even then very rarely, but because um, usually one spouse will eventually just leave the business. But what I will tell you is what's interesting about the ones that you do see work out, it's almost always, uh, it's never friends, that never works, but I've never seen it work ever. But um, what is interesting is that this, either spouse can do the business 100% without the other. So if anything were to happen to the other spouse, the other one is just as a type personality and could run it just as well. It's not like I do the marketing and then he goes out and meets the people, that doesn't work. So. No partners and um, understand what financial freedom means. You guys, this is the other thing is that you have to, if you really want to have true freedom, you've got to put a cap on your financial aspirations because it's not all about money. And I know that sounds silly, but the people who I've seen these guys and girls who um, actually, I'll just say it's only guys that I know who've done it that were actually, they used to be my mentors and they're not anymore. I've seen men who have just chased the cash again and again and again until their 60s and 70s. There is no end in sight. It is a total, it's a total debacle, it's a disaster. Don't do it. The best thing to do is just understand that financial freedom, whether you're a fan of Robert Kiyosaki, he says you're financially free when your assets pay for your liabilities. Dave Ramsey says that you're financially free when you can live off of 8% of your nest egg. And uh, the FIRE movement, they say that you're financially free when you can live off of 4% of your nest egg. Here's the bottom line. 
There is no definition of financial freedom without knowing your fixed expenses. So if you make a lot and you spend a lot, you're going to be broke now, you were broke last year, you're going to be broke in 10 years, it doesn't matter how much you make. So what's financial freedom? Just get a fixed budget. Money is a game. Once you win the game, pick a new game. Health, fitness, time with your children, time with your family, pick a new business to build a charity. You can absolutely win the money of game and then stop playing it and go to a new game. It's really easy. It is, there's nothing new under the sun. It's all been done before. Wholesaling is easy. Wholesalers are complicated. That's it, guys. <laughs>